Good morning, church. It's good to have to see all of you here. I'm happy to be here. Now, let me ask the question. How many of you would rather be off in a hospital somewhere or here? All right. So we, that's good. That's good. Y'all want to be here. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Our announcements today are visitors. If you would text hi to 636-742-1011, or you can fill out a visitor card there in your pew. For those of you who are online, if you would like or comment on the live stream, Tuesday, January 31st at 11 a.m., we have a nominating committee meeting for those of you who are on the nominating committee. Wednesday, February 1st at 6.30, we will have a business meeting. Thursday, February 2nd, 4.30 p.m., deacons meeting. Saturday, February 11th at 5 p.m., we have our Valentine's banquet, and there's a sign-up sheet out in the vestibule where you can sign up for that, so please do that. We'll have a good time. Um, then we want you to save the date for the First Baptist Women's Conference, April 19th through the 21st. We're going to, to Branson. We're going to see the, the uh, production of, of Esther as we've been in the Bible study of e Esther. So really looking forward to that. And uh, you may see Sarah if you need to know more information. Uh, also, we have a lot of Christmas cards yet on the table out here. If you would pick those up, if they've got your name on them, we'd appreciate that. And then also, Rob asked uh, me to announce that uh, 5 p.m. Thursday, there will be a um, restoration committee or renovation committee meeting. So um, we will look forward to all that's going on this week because in all that we do it's in service to our lord thank you thank you uh i'm gonna do a, a, a worship uh, prayer and uh let's pray dear heavenly father we you know thank you all all your uh, very very presence in our congregation, Lord. Father, we know, thank you for all, all your blessings and uh, what you do for us, Lord. And, and uh, uh, we, just, we just thank you for our eternal salvation in Jesus Christ, Lord. Father, we do pray for our congregation, especially for Brother Tommy and his families on the, a traveling mercy for them that uh, you bring them back safely to us. Uh, uh, continually pray for my wife. Uh, Father, we also pray for Debbie uh, Struckoff that she's going to have her surgery for, on uh, February 9th. And Father, we just uh, pray for all our uh, uh, all our needs that we couldn't think of. But Father, you know what we need for even to ask for it, Lord. Uh, we just pray this all in Jesus' name. Also, uh, I could introduce uh, Brother John and uh, his wife Darlene a little later, but I'll do it now. Uh, we just want to welcome Brother John and uh, Darlene uh, Persley, and he's going to bring the message. But that'll be after the after the singing. Thank you.
sometimes I think the scripture speaks of a, a sacrifice of praise. And sometimes our sacrifice is sloppy. Today I hope our sacrifice is heartfelt. Sometimes our sacrifice might be a big sacrifice. And maybe today your sacrifice is all you have is two little mites. You know, just a small amount, Lord. Take this and multiply it. But if your heart is turned toward the Lord and your eyes look beyond the pain that you might be feeling today or the sadness or the sorrow and your eyes are focused upon the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, maybe our sacrifice can be a little bit less sloppy today. So let's just praise God today and sing, we will glorify the King of Kings we will glorify the Lamb. Scripture on our, in our hymnals says, um, Blessing and honor and glory and dominion to the one seated on the throne, to the Lamb. Let's praise God. the next page 23 thou art worthy Blessed be the Lord God Almighty. You might find a little bit of a theme going on here in the book of Revelation. John the Revelator saw the Lord, the Lamb, the one that was slain and risen from the grave, the one who was worthy to open the, the book. And all of these elders and all of these thousands and ten thousands and thousands and thousands were praising God with a loud voice, the scripture says. 
might as well practice now because that's what we're going to be doing for a long time. <laughs> okay. Blessed be the Lord. I exalt thee.
Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we know, <clears throat> thank you for all your blessings, Lord, and, and all you do for us, Lord. And Father, we just rejoice in your salvation uh, eternally. And we eternally thank you for, our, for this wonderful salvation in Christ. Father, we just pray that this offering will go where it's most uh, needed, Lord. And we just pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, the children's church, or children can be dismissed as children's church. And brother, brother John, would you come forward? Good morning, everybody. Thank you for having me and Darlene. We uh, appreciate it. We appreciate the gift. And man, really appreciate the warm welcome you all gave us. So sometimes when I pull up to a church where I'm speaking at, I, I'm, I feel like I'm sitting in somebody's seat and parked in somebody's parking spot. So I appreciate your warm welcome. And don't forget, if you like my sermon today that God has laid on my heart, tell Brother Tommy. And if you don't, the Bible warns against gossip, so <laughs> think about that. Yeah, I really appreciate the opportunity. We live in Lonedale. I pastored New Hope Church for several years and just kind of travel around now to churches in our association. And when somebody's on vacation or COVID, I always keep one handy because Saturday night seems like God attacks our pastors with COVID on Saturday night. So anyway, if you would turn your Bibles to Isaiah 66, and stand with me as I read the Word of God together, if you can, please. 66, 1 through 4. I entitled this message, God is God, what can we give Him? Heaven is my throne, and earth is my footstool, and where is the house that you will build me? And where is the place of my rest? For all those things my hands is made, and all those things exist, says the Lord. But on this one will I look, on, who, on him who is poor and of a contrite spirit, and who trembles at my word. He who kills a bull as if he slays a man, he who sacrifices a lamb as if he breaks a dog's neck, he who offers a grain offering as if he offers swine's blood, he who burns incense, as if he bless an idol, just as they have chosen their own ways and their soul delights in their abominations, so will I choose their delusions and will bring their fears on them. Because when I called, no one answered. When I spoke, they did not hear. But they did evil before my eyes and chose that in which I did not delight. Let's pray. Father, I am indeed grateful for this opportunity to bring your word. And Lord, I pray in the next few minutes that we would just open our minds and our hearts and that your Holy Spirit would have your way in each and every one of our minds and our hearts. That these words would be your words that I'm about ready to speak. And the Lord, that we would pay attention and we would get the message that you have, that you have for each and every one of us. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. This is uh, the part of the, the Bible that uh, really speaks to us. When you stop and really think about all the things that's going on here in Isaiah's life, and he comes to this part in the scriptures here where Isaiah 
brings these truths about where we, the people of that day, and we today, stand with God. What is our expectations of God? What is, what is God's expectations of us? What can we, like I said, give Him? What can we give God? What does He expect from us? What can we do for Him? In all these answers, we, we uh, hopefully I answer those by the time we get done here today. Now, the first point I come up with is expectations of life. What, what does that mean? Well, you know, each and every one of us, is, some of us have been saved when we were very young. Some have been saved when they are later on in life. I, I accepted Christ when I was around 17 years old. And I, uh, so I had these expectations of life as a sinner and also as a child of God in my 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 uh, and my my group as I grew up. So uh, as we go through this and we look at expectations of life, as everybody knows, no matter how long you've lived, sooner or later there's going to be ups and downs in life. And the way we handle these, the way we uh, can be able to move on, is what our expectations are of life. You know, some of us had. Big goals. Some of us got big goals. Arlene just retired a couple of weeks ago. I retired three or four years ago, and we we spent our whole life. In, in, both of us been saved from day one. We were uh, pra- Prospect Baptist Church. We were the uh, youth directors for many many years until I got tired of lock-ins and the music that kids play these days. So I surrendered to the ministry and went to Missouri Baptist. But our expectations of life through that period of time, changed. Especially whenever I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior. Now I'm looking through the the eyes of Christ as a new creation in Him. So when we're saved uh, and we get all that right with God and we start our life and the expectations that we have for life, I mean, we don't have any troubles. Everything's great. I mean, from... Seven, I'm 66 years old now. Everything has just been on top of the mountain all the way through. Amen? Amen? No? You all had some problems. That's, that's right. We have problems. We have mountains. We have valleys. We have, uh, uh, we, we're human. So there's going to be certain expectations as we go through life. And some of them are going to be met, and some of them are going to be destroyed, and some of them we can, with no longer our expectations, we have changed the goals of life or whatever you want to talk about. But here's, here's the thing, and this is what I really want you to get out of this, is depending on our view of God, depending on our view of God, will determine how we deal with the ups and downs of life. What do I mean by that? Well, if, you're, if our view of God is Fortune 500 God, if he's going to buy us all a Cadillac and put it in all of our driveways and pay all of our bills and, and uh, all we got to do is sit and, on our knees and pray and uh, the money's going to flock in and make a Fortune 500 God, then we're going to be disappointed when our financial expectations are not met. Amen? Because that's that we have put, uh, we have changed God into a a God that will meet all our financial needs, and that's it. So if we view God as a time of trouble, God, that's the only time we really need Him is that time of trouble. Then when trouble comes, we're going to. Uh, be very disappointed in our life as we go through life because if we just see him in times of trouble then we don't get his blessings in our daily lives as we walk with him and if our view of God is a, uh, a God that is a loving almighty God who doesn't have any consequences to our life we just everything's good uh, all of everybody's going to go to heaven it, we can sin as much as we want to sin. There's no consequences for any of that. Then you're going to never, ever walk in the blessings of God 
through the Holy Spirit. So, if we consider God as the great I am, and if we consider God as the Alpha, the Omega, the creator, the sustainer of life, the God of all gods, the one and only true God, and that's exactly who he is, and we have our faith, our life in this God, then we may not always understand what's going on. We may not always understand the valleys or the peaks. We may not always have uh, clarity on the different situations of life, but we'll always know that we have faith in God, the true God, and we'll always know that this, this is what we're at here on earth is just temporary, and eventually we're going to spend eternity with Almighty God. Now that's the God that I want us to kind of dwell on today, if you will. Now it, the second I want, point I want you to see is God the Creator. In Isaiah 66, the first part of one, uh, the number one and the first part of two, it says that Isaiah is saying here that we're looking, these people uh, at this time were kind of looking to help out God. And they had the wrong view of God. Isaiah here is finishing his final summary of his prophecy with a reminder that God is not looking for a temple. God is not looking for a big fancy temple of stone and all that goes along with it. God is, is, is he being the creator of the universe and everything that is, he already has that. He's already created that. So he wants more from out of you, from you and I. So, and I mean, if you stop and just think about God's creation and all that he'd done and, and built a, a bat, just took it out of nothing and created everything, it's beautiful. It's, it's perfect. We can't add to that. And that's when, when I talk to atheists, that's the first thing I say is, and I kind of quit after this, when you explain to me where the ocean come from that we all come out of, then we'll have another talk. But until you can do that, we're kind of done. So, verse 1 and 2 says, Heaven is my throne, earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you will build me, and where is the place of my rest? For all those things my hand has already made, and though this and those things exist because of me, says the Lord. So, uh, turn with me, if you will, or, or just listen to me as I as I read this, these, these, road, these words from Job, Job 38, just one of my favorite passages of Scripture when it comes to a person, Job, uh, wanting, to ex wanting to kind of uh, confront God on what's going on in his life. And, that, and I, it, it, being 66 years old, I've had several situations in my life that I didn't understand. And I took to God, and I was searching for questions, I mean, for answers of my questions. And so we know the story of Job, I think we do. It, his situation is that, he's, uh, he, that Satan went to God and said, he, of course, Job will serve you. He's, uh, uh, you've given him so much. And God said, well, you can take all of his, uh, all, everything he has, all the possessions that he has, but just don't, you know, you don't hurt him. And then... Uh, he does all that, and then God goes back. He takes, you know, his children and his animals and everything die and and uh, stolen and all that. And he goes back, and Job still, the Bible says, never sinned. And then he went back to uh, uh, Satan, went back to God and said, well, of course, you, you took his possessions, but what if I take some of his health? And he said, well, go ahead and do that. And he did, and he took all that. And the Bible says that still Job never sinned against God. But Job did have some questions with God. Job did need some answers from God. In chapter 38 of Job, God answers those questions. Now, just put yourself there. Let's just say it was you, me, everybody here sitting on a pew here, and God is uh, 
talking to Job. Now think about this. Here's what he says. Who is this who darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Now, prepare yourself uh, like a man. I will question you and you shall answer me. Now, God asked Job this. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding of this. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know, he tells Job. Now, this is... Job was a, the priest of his family. Job would offer sacrifices for his children just to make sure there was no sin in their lives. So for us to say it's a stretch that we are in situations we, we don't understand is we, all we got to do is look at Job's life. He's in a situation we don't understand. He took some terrible counsel from his friends and he's kind of questioning God. So God is straightening him out. Where were you when all this was going on? To what is there's foundation fastened? Or who laid its cornerstone? And when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy, or what shut up in the seas with doors when it bore forth and issued from the womb? Do you understand what I'm saying is God was telling, was addressing Job with all of his concerns. And his concerns is, Job, what have you built for me? What can you give me? What can you do for me? And Job has no answers. Job finally just says, God, I was wrong. And he gets back in fellowship with God and just accepts the situation he was in until God brought him out of that situation. And that's, that's the God that I want you guys to understand about today. That's the God you and I serve. It don't matter what situation you're in. It don't matter where we're at in life. It don't matter what's going on up to this point. We're in God's plan. And sometimes that's hard to understand, but we're in God's plan. We should be, instead of, uh, instead of like uh, criticizing God, we should be waiting for what's going to happen next, amen? Because we know it's going to be good. So then we point three is the, if you go back with me to uh, Isaiah, we see these vain sacrifices, and, and uh, I read them to you, and it's, uh, I want to just kind of, uh, just kind of skip over them, just to, except for I'm going to read. I read. I use John MacArthur's New King, King James, and he makes some really good comments in the footnotes. Footnotes, and this says on this section that I read there already from three up to four, it says that to sacrifice a lamb with an attitude no different than if it were a dog betrayed the empty hardness of the offerer. All these images are meant to illustrate the shadow hypocrisy of one who makes an offering to God. So what he's saying is all these examples that we see here in verse 3, all of them go against Leviticus. All of them go against God, uh, all of them go against God the way he set up sacrifices to be. God said, set apart an animal, set apart, make sure that it's flawless before you bring it to me. And people will just bring in their sacrifices to him and saying, what, you know, uh, I, I don't know about the best one, but this is one that I've got. And this is what I want you to sacrifice. Now, thank God that you and I don't have to do that. Now, that should be an amen, because think of, read Leviticus, what a deal it was to go to the temple and, talk, and go to the high priest and sacrifice an animal for our sin. So now we've got Jesus Christ, amen? Jesus Christ sacrifice, the final sacrifice on the cross, paid the price for all of our sin, the perfect sacrifice, bled, shed his blood, put in a tomb, raised again, for, and, and sets on the right hand of God for you and I. Now that is what we have today. But I wonder at times, at, because I go, we go several places, and I wonder at times that, that uh, for one thing, I, you know, that I asked Brother Tommy, I said, do you think the people would mind if I wear a suit. Now think about that. Fifteen years ago, that would have never crossed my mind. Twenty years ago, for sure. But now I, I would, it, when, you, when somebody asks you to come and preach at their church, you've got to ask, would I offend people by wearing a suit? I wear a suit because it's what I've got best in my closet. And, 
And I do it because I, I, I want to give God my, I try to give God my best. Now, I'm not saying that preaching with a, with, without a tie on, I, there's nothing wrong with that. I'm just saying that I, I didn't never thought I'd have to ask the church if, I, if it's okay for me to wear a suit. And Tommy said, well, of course, there'd be people there that really like that suit. And I said, okay. So I bought my best, best one, didn't I? This is my best one. So anyway, we see all these, these vain. I wonder what kind of sacrifices do we mess up today? Or not, not mess up, but uh, maybe not offer our best. I wonder when, when we go into these uh, uh, churches and, and uh, you know, uh, if you get watch the TV churches and all that, uh, I listen to all kinds of sermons. Uh, when, when the song service comes on, what do they call that? Let's, let's, let's worship, right? I mean, it's, it's worship time. Well, worship time is when you wake up, amen? It's, it's when you wake up until seven days a week, 365 days a year. That's worship time. But we've got this, uh, not, not a, it's okay. There's nothing wrong with it. But I just hope and pray that uh, in some of these churches that put on such a display of music with smoke and lights and all that, that that's not what they're worshiping. I hope they're praying and worshiping just as much when the preacher gets up there and preaches the word of God. That's all I'm saying. And I think that could be an issue in some churches. Now, other things, of course, is uh, uh, where, do we, uh, where do we allot our funds? Or do we give God what God has blessed us with? And another one is, and every preacher in the world would want me to say this, because I've I, uh, I, when I was a pastor, I, I, I really wanted people to spend time with God. We're, are we shorting God with our time? Because Bible study and prayer, the hearing the preacher of the word, the teaching of the word and all that is where our foundation is so we can fight the wiles of the devil. And so when it, it, our, or are we cheating? Are we sacrificing our time with God? Are we giving God his due time? Um, and I, I wonder at times uh, if we think as, as people that God is really moving more in mega churches than he is in the little small Baptist church or country church out in the middle of nowhere that, that runs 10 or 15 people. Or is he blessing more of anything in between those mega churches and the little country church? I don't know. He's not. Why? Because he's looking for one thing. And I'm, it, the one thing that God's looking for is the next thing, the next thing we look at, which is the fourth, and that is Isaiah 66, 2B, 2A, and B. What is God looking for? What can we give God? God, God is in the little church out in the country where five or six people go. God is in the mega churches. He's in everything in between. So what can we give God? One thing. But on this one will I look. On him who is poor and of a contrite spirit and who trembles at my word. Think about that. Just, just stop and think about that for a second. Tur Turn with me to Matthew. I'm sorry, Matthew 5, 1 through 11. The Beatitudes. Let's, let's just go through them real fast there and we'll be done. Here, here is the where we, I think we struggle with, with the Christian life. Because of, uh, not because we don't love God, because I know we love God. Not because we don't, we're not saved, because I know we're saved. We're going to be in heaven together someday. But this is what we, 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 we struggle with, was what can I do for God? What you can do for God, what I can do for God, is give our heart to him. You know, uh, I've made some, you know, my Christian life, Darlene and I, uh, through the years, made a lot of decisions that I had to wait and ponder on and think about and pray about to God. And God, Darlene, we got this little pond at our house, and Darlene sees me down there with a fishing rod in my hand, sitting in a lounge chair, and without no bait on my hook, she knows that God's working on me doing something. And I'm down there thinking, that's my spot. You know, be still and know that I am God. That's where I go. And so 
uh, when, I, when I think about all that and when I get ready to make the big decisions in my life, I have to go to the Beatitudes and see where I'm at in life. So the very first one that we see is in, in, in Matthew 5, uh, it, uh, verse 3, it said, blessed are the poor in spirit. Now, blessed are the poor in spirit. What does it mean to be poor in spirit? Well, it's opposite of self-sufficiency. Self-sufficiency. We are spiritually bankrupt apart from God. That's our heart. I'm talking about our heart now. Our heart needs to be given to God. All, if we're going to give him anything, this is what we should give him. Because he's the creator of everything else. We can't give him anything but our heart. The reward to that is theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That's a pretty good reward. And that's where everybody should say amen. Because we're all going to go to heaven one day. Now, fourth, verse 4 there says, Blessed are those who mourn. Now, what, are, what is he talking about on the mourning? Well, people are uh, here that mourn over their sin, that, that take their sin seriously, that just, uh, you know, we're all chief sinners, as Paul says, but if, when we sin, we, if we realize that it's against God and God only, and we, we get on our knees and pray for forgiveness of that so we can get back into fellowship with God. But uh, mourn over our sin. The mourning, if you will, that brings true repentance. And the reward of that, of course, is forgiveness and salvation of being in fellowship with Almighty God. And then verse 5, blessed are the meek, self-controlled, empowered by the Holy Spirit. That's what we all are looking for. That's the only way we can walk with God is to be self-controlled and be able to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. If I wasn't empowered by the Holy Spirit to uh, get up here and speak and, and preach the word of God in his name, then I, I would it would just be even worse than what it is. Amen? So verse 5, I mean, verse 5 said that the meek and the reward of, is in Psalms 37, 11, and of course we inherit the earth. Verse 6, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. A right relationship with God is what this is talking about. That we hunger for this righteousness, this right relationship with God. Remember, we, we as human beings, and I know you know this, everybody, we will fill our life with whatever we seek after. That's just a fact. Uh, Darlene and I like fishing. Uh, we, like, we like to go to Truman and, and crappie fish, and we could let that become a hindrance to our working to the Lord. Whatever we fill our life with, whatever we fill our life with, that's what we're going to seek after. So we say, God is saying here, hunger and thirst for righteousness. Fill your life with righteousness. Reward, God will fill you. God will fill you. In verse 7, those who are merciful, those who are merciful, blessed are those who are merciful. A forgiving spirit and a loving others. Think about that. We have mercy. Jesus has showed mercy on us. It's only right that we show mercy on others. Reward, show mercy, receive mercy. Number eight, blessed are the pure in heart. Those that are pure in heart are not sinless. We, we, we still sin. We still have our you know, times of uh, because we are human, 1 John 1, 8. But the truth of God within our hearts is not divided between God and the world. When we have a pure heart, we try our best to be caught a uh, prayed up and read up and, 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 and studied up and uh, be, walk in the righteousness of God. Because that's what God says. He, that's what we can give him, is a, a pure heart. And then verse 9, blessed are the peacemakers. Those who are peacemakers, 
In order to walk in peace with the world, you must be at peace with God. You got to be at peace with God. That's, that's, that's the thing. You know, uh, when I surrendered to the ministry, I had no peace of God until I surrendered to the ministry. When, when you say, here am I, Lord, send me, and he uh, sends you, no matter where he does or where he, what he has for you, that's the only way you can have peace with God is to be in the middle of his will. And the middle of his will is we are to be peacemakers. And the reward for that, being called sons and daughters of the Most High God. And in verse 10 and 11, and this is uh, the one that uh, probably is going to get worse and worse on the Christian as time goes on, those who are persecuted. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. We should never be guilty of deliberately asking God for persecution. Believe me, if you stand for God and you stand up for God and live for God and witness to God, you will eventually get some persecution in your life. You know, uh, if we live godly lives, persecution will come. But we face nothing. I mean, I, I got a real good buddy of mine that's a, a, a missionary in Albania, and he has to walk a tightrope. He has to be able to give the gospel at certain times in certain ways, and he has to walk a tight walk. If he gets on the wrong side of that tight walk rope, he gets sent back to the estates. He's been there for several years, so he knows what he's doing, and he's won a lot of people to the Lord. The Lord has worked mightily in his, in his stay there. But that's what I'm saying. He has been persecuted. He has been thrown out of different places. He's been persecuted. So I, don't, I can't really say I've been per persecuted. I've been laughed at and I've been called a Jesus freak and all kinds of names through the years. But, you know, it's nothing compared to what the disciples and the apostles went through when they were writing this blessed book that we call the Bible. So our reward is the kingdom of heaven. And here's the thing. We just, sometimes we just say, well, we're going to get to go to heaven. Well, think about it. We're going to be with Christ. We're going to be with the disciples, the apostles, the prophets. We're going to be with all those. Praising God together in one accord. Throwing the, our crowns or whatever we receive at Jesus' feet. Our reward is going to be in the same company in heaven. Jesus, prophets, all of them. I can't wait for that. So, my, my thank to this whole message is one thing. So God, so God is good. What can we give Him? We can. We just got to give Him our heart. We just got to say, you know, here I am, Lord. Said, mean if we know that we're not in fellowship with Him, we need to get in fellowship with Him so that we He can use us, especially during this time. Because there's going to be times when you're going to have to be the peacemaker. There's going to be times when you're going to have to show mercy. There's going to be times whenever we have to love the unlovely. And so we're going to have to stand on these beatitudes. But I say that it all starts today. As we have this invitation time here, we're going to go two stanzas and that's it. I don't beg anybody to come to the Lord. But if the Lord has put it on your heart that you need to get right with him, get right with him wherever you sit or come up and talk to Brother Mike Whatever it takes, whatever you want to do, but just don't leave here unless your heart is right with God. Let's pray together. Father, I come to you now thankful for these words. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the way you have blessed. Thank you for these people that are here. And I pray that, I've, uh, that your word has touched them as it has touched me. Now, I, at this invitation time, I just ask that you would have your way in our hearts, that we'd Open our mind and open our hearts to you and just, Lord, just 
bring us to a closer relationship with you. If we need, if there be one here that does not know you, today is the day of salvation. If there be one here that is not right with you, today would be the day that get their hearts right with you. And Lord, I just pray that you would have your way in this invitation time. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Mike, would you step forward as we sing a couple of them? All stand and... saint who's grieving or sorrowful and want just a little bit of time to tell it to Jesus. Let's sing verse 2. Do the tears flow down the cheeks of my head. Tell it to Jesus. Tell it to Jesus. Thank you, Angie. And uh, Brother John, thank you for that wonderful message. Uh, we just want to uh, thank you all that uh, uh, come, and we just uh, pray for the ones that couldn't make it here today. Uh, and uh, remember all was said in the bulletin, and, and you all have a good, uh, good uh, safe way home. Uh, let's close in prayer, and we'll close with the doxology after I pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you that uh, you're, you're always with us, Lord, and you never, never forsake us or leave us, Lord. And Father, we just want to thank you for your uh, all your many blessings, and, uh, and Father, we just pray that uh, <clears throat> we will uh, walk in your graces and in your works uh, this week and proclaim the wonderful gospel. We just wonderful gospel. We just pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>